three, two, one. Here we go. All right, here we go. Episode five. Welcome back to X's and O's NBA Breakdown. I'm your host, Mark Tinklenberg, and I'm here with my co-host, Zach Walker, and another co-host, Coach O, who I will be introducing in a minute. But I just want to take a second and remind you guys to add us on Twitter and Instagram at X underscore breakdown. And please subscribe and listen to our pod while giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You guys know that every review means the world to us. So please continue to do that so we can continue to do what we love. All right, episode five, we're going to jump in right away. Coach O, Zach, what's going on, guys? What up? Yo, like I was saying, man, I feel like I made it, you know? <laughs> I'm on the pod, mama. <laughs> Let's we're go. doing it. We're I'm excited. Doing it. Thank, hey, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, this podcast coming out has been, has been good to me, just giving me constant um, information on the game. And I just keep getting better. So thank you guys for having me and keep up the good work. I'm a fan. Thanks, Coach. Oh, we appreciate, appreciate you. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a couple. This is going to be a fun episode. I'm, I, we're looking through the stuff right now. This is going to be really fun. So we're going to first dive in. Um, NBA season started about a week ago. Um, and what a week it's been already, um, some insane scores across the league, some blowouts that we've never seen before. Um, and we've seen kind of some good and some bad. So, uh, we're going to kind of just jump out and talk about some things that have stood out. So I'm going to ask you guys first, what has stood out to you guys so far about the games and the environments with no fans across the league, like, or dislike, what do you guys think? I think... So it still kind of has that bubble feel, right? So it still kind of feels that right now. Um, it still has that like uh, rec league type feel to it, but I don't know. I feel like there's still a little bit more excitement than there was with the bubble. It, I don't, I don't know if it's just the new season, the fresh, the can anything happen right now? Uh, you know, we're three, four games in and the possibilities of who's going to take really the East. Cause let's be honest, it's going to be the Lakers in the West, but like who's gonna who's gonna do whatever? It, it's kind of just that like exciting feeling where I'm like checking my box score every five minutes on seeing what's going, who's going off that night. It's just NBA is back, and we didn't have to wait that long, so it's it's exciting. Coach O, what you got? What you think? Oh man, it's it's fun. It's fun. It's like I'm in basketball heaven. It's fun. Um, the obviously the constant story, the constant developing story is what's happening with the pandemic. Um, from night to night, you just hope that everybody's safe. But um, right now, NBA is doing a NBA players and staff are doing a great job. Nobody has been quote unquote tested positive, so that's always good sign for the league. That means everybody is one into it. Two uh, players are making the sacrifice; they want to play. So I think that's important too. That means all hands are on deck. And like you said, I com I completely agree with you with the bubble feeling, like. Um, it's almost like an, an extended preseason almost where teams are slowly getting into it. It's, uh, it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. I do find it, I think it's really interesting when I watch games though, players aren't phased by it at all. Like they aren't phased mm -hmm. by the fact there's no fans. Uh, that going back to the bubble, I think it definitely prepared them for this. And we're still seeing really high quality basketball across the league. Um, you know, teams are, are starting to round into form after a short preseason, and, and that's going to take a little bit longer this year. So there obviously is some sloppiness here and there, um, but there's been a lot of competitive games already. Um, you know, we've seen some storylines coming out in true NBA form. Uh, the drama is building already, and we're just a weekend of the season. So I agree 100%, but I, I do find it really cool that the players, as you said, they're, they're definitely in it because the games don't feel any different without fans. I mean, obviously the noise and that, that adds to the drama of the game, but the game itself has just been mm -hmm. beautiful so far. Uh, I love it. It's been was, so, so I, fun to watch. Oh, for sure. And you know what? I was just watching. What, Like I said, it's going to be an ongoing, ongoing story for the whole uh, season. Just – because they're talking about maybe getting people in slowly. We don't know about yeah. that. But right now, the players are playing. But what's interesting, I was watching Utah. Utah had fans in their stadium. Yeah. 
So now I'm starting to wonder if the situation doesn't change and things still stay status quo. Is that considered an unfair advantage for Utah? Let's say you go into the playoffs. That could be interesting. Right? That could right? be interesting. Yeah, I mean, if you're having all, if you're not having that that pumped in fan, fake fan stuff, but you have real fans and you can turn around and feed off that that crowd, I'd give that a little bit of an edge. I'm gonna uh, play a little harder. I mean, they're playing hard now, but there's nothing there's nothing better than playing in front of whatever fans that you, you can get. Mm, agreed. Yeah, and and that that leads us basically to my next question for you guys, and that is, um, what teams so far? Um, we had a pod, our first pod was, uh, kind of predictions and we did a season preview and it was all about who we thought based on free agency and coaching and the acquisitions, who we thought was going to be some surprise teams. Um, and you know, we had those free agencies, uh, kind of locked in, in a way that it felt like, uh, you had your clear top teams in the West. And then in the East, the East was getting stronger. It felt like uh, before the season started. And I think we're kind of seeing this play out uh, a little bit like normal. I think things are going to shake out. The West is really strong. Uh, And we're seeing that again. It's going to be a competitive West, but it's going to be a really competitive East. So who do we see that's been underperforming or exceeding those expectations? I know we're only a weekend, um, but what do you guys think based on what you thought uh, going into the season? I'll say the here's the way too early what the heck is going on. The East feels like it's almost completely flipped, right? As far as who's won the first few games, who's losing the first few games. The fact that I'm seeing Orlando at 4-0, like, you know, like the teams Cleveland. like that. <laughs> like Cleveland, like what's happening right now? Pacers, who of course I get to talk about whenever I can, Three and one, great start to the season with a with a new coach and new system, all of that going on over there, and they're 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 really competitive. Where I had them in the seventh eighth spot because I'm a realist fan, and to me, everybody in the else in the East was getting better while they stayed the same. So I'm like, I, I, right now, I, again, four or five games in, it's way too early, but it's all flip. But you have like Atlanta, who was a surprise team for us, Tink, when we talked about that the last episode and kind of like everyone look at this roster, they're young, but they had some injuries last year. So having some, the assets that they got over the off season, they were kind of a free agent winner for us. They're playing really well. Mm-hmm. They're playing really, really well. And you're starting to see maybe a little bit of the defense start to come in on that team, which is really, really huge for them. Again, three, four games in, everything could change in the next two weeks and we don't know, but it, it's just, it's really weird when you look at these teams in the East and what's going on. It, it's like you talked about Atlanta. I, Atlanta was one of my surprise teams. I like Atlanta. I like how, I like how the pieces kind of fit. I like that you fact that you could have Trey, you could have Trey sit down and Rondo would still give you that productivity. I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. At first Rondo, I was thinking, you remember when Rondo had that history about, Oh, he doesn't want to come off the bench and stuff like that. That was going to be my first reason for it not to possibly work in Atlanta. But after seeing what Rondo did last year with the Lakers, absolutely. I'm like, he's going to come into that. He's going to fit right away. And now you add bogey. Bogey is a, Oh man, Bogey's a stud, another mm-hmm. big player. And don't forget also last year, it's a, it's an outlier, but Clint Capella didn't play. Yep, exactly. So I like Atlanta and it, it's still early, but what's happening now is the better teams, the ones who were in the bubble longer and also the veteran teams, they understand that this is a marathon. So they're not playing to their full potential so it's not crazy to see the lakers not winning every single game right now because the lakers will turn up and you know what the thing is with the lakers too lakers don't need to be in that first spot to give damage in the playoffs because if there's no fans it doesn't matter Mm-hmm. Well, and, and, you know, we have our group text with our fellas. We'll see. We have one person that always gives Mark a lot of crap for being a, a Lakers fan and like tries to get him to be emotional towards it and saying that they suck. And you're like, this is how they start almost every year. Plus, they just won the championship. They're not going to come out and play like the championship Lakers the first few games of, of the season. Like they're going to settle in. LeBron's going to do his thing and make sure he's getting people 
the ball, mm-hmm. get them involved. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just what he's done his whole career. Mm-hmm. He's going to make sure that everyone's prepared for the end of the season. The beginning of the season doesn't matter as much. Yeah. They're, they're, you may see them rip off the next like six or seven too. I mean, and, mm-hmm. and that's just how you, like you said, uh, coach Ellie, like when they're ready to turn up and it's, it's time, you know, they're, they're not um, of concern for any of us. I don't think. Um, they have LeBron James and Anthony Davis. They're fine. Yeah, they're doing, <laughs> they're doing fine. Um, yeah. And I think in the, I think to kind of piggyback off what you were saying in the East, there, there are some surprising things I think in the West too. Um, and some of our predictions so far have been right. Um, I see, I know people are not going to agree with me, but I see Portland as a real threat in the West. I Absolutely. As a team that made perfect acquisitions in the off season. I, I love coach Stotts. I always have. Um, mm-hmm. He's a player's coach. They, they, they obviously enjoy playing for him and their roster got significantly better in key areas. You know, Covington, Absolutely. Covington coming in completely changed their, their entire roster based on what, he does and exactly what they needed right they needed that wing stopper knockdown three shooter that they just flat out didn't have Rodney Hood coming back from injury so I really like Portland I I we had them as the second tier I really like Portland a lot Phoenix is coming up uh they Mm -hmm. blew the doors off of New Orleans last night Mm -hmm. Uh, you know that they have obviously two great players and they have a, a dominant big at times when he wants to be assertive, but he's a seven footer and he's athletic. And, you know, DeAndre Ayton, for all things considered, he's a guy that all 29 teams would take on their roster. So hands down, mm-hmm. hands down. You have to keep yeah. that stuff in context as you're working through, oh, he's not playing well. But yeah, but you know what? He'd be on, he'd be starting on any team in the NBA. Like he would. So, um, so they're up and coming. So yeah, both sides filling out to be extremely competitive um, and the underperforming side of it would, would just be from my perspective would just be kind of how some of these teams aren't jumping on the opportunity that right. has been given to them in the first week. Because as you said, coach O and Zach, that mm-hmm. some of these other teams are just, you know, they know they're going to be okay at the end. Some, some of these other teams that are still trying to fight their way through it, this is their time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, let's, let's talk about the Lakers for a second. Lakers. I like Lakers. I like, because they got better. I think they got better, but you know what, Mark, you're not going to like this. (laughs) My only concern is my only concern is Frank Vogel is going to have to change the way that they play defense. Hear me, hear me out. Last year, you had rim protection. You had McGee at the rim. Um, you had McGee at the rim. Anthony Davis was helping off of the sides, right? You had Dwight Howard come off the bench. You could have that rim protection. I think that's what made the Lakers elite. Mm-hmm. They were able to challenge you vertically at the rim. Right now, yes, I saw some, some little things that I was a little bit worried about. And like, I could see them having a problem against a Denver and a Portland, like we said, where you have a good guard who's able to make that pocket pass, right? And then you have a big who's able to attack that back line. That's something that I'm a little bit worried about. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to lie. So, and, and you were talking about in one of your, in one of our past episodes, we can't put Trez as a rim protector, right? Trez is going to trap. Trez is going to hedge. Trez is going to hard show. But Trez's forte is not him being at the rim. That's what I'm a little bit worried about. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a very fair assessment. I mean, they lost their two most athletic bigs. And Dwight Howard is, is still one of, if not, one of the strongest players in the league. Beyond his Absolutely. athleticism and beyond his rim protection, he's also a brick wall. I mean, mm-hmm. guys don't get position and they're not able to attack any further at that point of contact. Point of contact right. hits between those two and he wins the battle uh, against mm-hmm. everybody. So, no, that, that, that's a fair assessment. Um, and I think one of the greatest things with Dwight Howard that, that we saw is that kind of like a mellow, he's accepting his role now, right? Mm-hmm. He's not going out going like, no, you're not a star anymore. You're not this. You're not the guy. 
but you can go, I just need you to go block shots, be a force down low and get me as many rebounds as you can. Give me those mm-hmm. hustle points. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's accepted that. And that's what you saw in the Lakers. He's like, you know what? I'll just go back. I owe the Lakers last year. I need, I need to kind of, you know, he left the last time and not so good of terms. And he, he's like, I owe it to this team. And he was just like, whatever you need me to do. And, and I, I think, I think that what you're saying is exactly right. And I think that the Lakers know that, right. I, I mean, the Lakers know that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they will find a way if they need to, I think that they'll make a key. They, they did a couple of things roster wise to make it so that they have the ability if they need to, to find somebody that could specialize in that area for them if needed. Um, but they did flip the script and they got a lot smarter. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's the thing. They got a lot more skilled. A lot more skills. Yep. They got better positionally on yep. both ends in terms yep. of how Mark Gasol defends is yep. miles ahead of JaVel and Dwight. Now, period. Dwight Dwight is really – he's probably equal positionally with Mark on the defensive end, but on the offensive end, he, Mark Gasol is miles ahead. Right. And right. So I think they're trying to counterbalance that. And also don't forget in the playoffs, AD will be the five. Uh, all things considered, when push comes to shove – that mm-hmm. rotation will come in and AD will be sitting out the five and wreaking havoc like they like they're so good at and it's so hard to defend. Um <laughs> so that this that reminded me talking to my one of my good friends who's the head assistant for the Heat, he said verbatim, we were praying, praying in those finals that they kept Dwight Howard on the floor. Now, why would that be? Right. And he was like, as soon as they put AD at the five and took Dwight Howard out, we were done. There was nothing we could do. It, it's just yeah. too hard of a matchup on both ends. So, you know, I think they'll go back to that. And so then leading into the next question, with that being said, who are your guys's? And coach, I'm going to start with you. Who are your top offensive and defensive teams so far? And do you think they'll remain that way throughout the year? Or do you see this as an early season kind of fluke? Let's go Let's go offense. I like the fluidity that Atlanta has. I really like Atlanta. Um, they're, constant, they're consistently making shots. They have shot makers now. And DeAndre Hunter has been, has been playing out of his mind. Trey Young is just being Trey Young. Um, I think they got those key additions. I like also in the East offensively, how can you not look down the street from Madison Square Garden and just see what Brooklyn has done? I think Spencer Dinwiddie being out with an ACL is a big hit for them. That's the hit. I, but I think that Brooklyn, again, I have concerns. Here are my concerns. <laughs> yeah, I'm so ready. I'm so oh, ready right man. now. Here are my concerns. Till this point, Steve Nash hasn't played Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Like Kevin Durant hasn't played one minute on the floor without Kyrie Irving. Right? So I think to a certain point, the rotation might have to change unless he sees, he probably has a reason for doing that, but unless he sees something that we don't see, because I I think when, when you have two elite players, I don't think you're letting them be elite if there's two of them are always playing at the same time. You know, growing up playing basketball, what they always taught me was that every time you add a player, so if I'm playing one-on-one, I'm responsible for all my shots. Two-on-two, I'm responsible for 50% of the shots because there's someone else that I have to be aware of. The more you add to that, right? So now you're coming into a situation with elite players as Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. I'm wondering if it could be, become something in the long run right now it's fun they're 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 dominant it's fun but i'm wondering if at a certain point one of them might have an off night both of them might have an off night and i'm wondering how that's gonna affect the second unit and now with spencer dinwiddie being out that's another curveball so that's what I have for these. That, that's what that, I- Zach will agree with you Zach you want to he he actually Zach sent me a text uh, just whenever it happened right away, he said, oh, man, this this could be really big for the Nets. That mm. then would he hurt. His it's tough. Be- for an ACL. And- it, it's tough because the thing is, you could rely on Spencer Dinwiddie. When you would take uh, both of them off, you could rely on Spencer Dinwiddie. But 
Now you're going to rely on Karis Levert. Levert is a great player. But what's happening is Levert is still in that stage where he's searching for identity. Can I yes. rely on him? That's, that's the talk. Can you rely on someone searching for identity? In the playoffs, it's proven. You need three players. You need three. Proven, proven, proven. You need three. Karis Levert did a little bit something in the bubble, but he wasn't in the playoffs. You get what I'm trying to say? So I think you don't have that third guy. That's the issue right there. Yeah, as soon as I saw that come across my ESPN, I text our group text with our podcast, mm-hmm. and I was like, this is huge. Because the first few games, I was like, I don't know in the East that even Milwaukee is going to keep up. With Nobody could touch them. Yeah. No one was going to touch them in the East. To me, after the first few games, they were they were my number one, more than likely. That, they're still going to be one mm-hmm. of the top four teams in the East, hands down. No, mm-hmm. Probably top three, top two, whatever it'll be. But losing him when they don't to me Levert like you said is great they don't have a lot of a whole whole lot of other options besides those two Mm -hmm. so then you go you've got two injury prone superstars can if something happens to them we're right back we're right back to where we were in the previous couple years Mm -hmm. so it I I just don't know I don't know I don't know about them um go ahead Sorry, it's good that he's taking shots. Like he's coming yeah. off, he's he's six, man. He's he's taking the shots. It's good. But my fear with that is if he's coming off the bench as a six man, is the same fear that I have for Milwaukee. Mm. Milwaukee, if you look at how Milwaukee's playing, Giannis is taking the ball and bringing it up the floor. Well, now what's happening in the playoffs? When I take away that first option, which is Giannis, your main point guards haven't been taking decisions all season and now you're expecting them to take decisions in crunch time that might be an issue yeah i don't know if that, that might be, and i was looking drew holiday i thought drew Holiday was going to handle the ball a little bit more he's not he's doing the same thing as eric bledsoe was doing so they're built to be a season team they're going to get some wins in the season and that's that's why we said in our season preview milwaukee's got to figure out how are you going to beat a team in a seven-game series yep. when the defense is designed to load up and stop Giannis getting in the lane and forcing perimeter shots, and you've got guys that aren't comfortable doing mm-hmm. things that they need to do to get through a team like Miami who's going to scheme the hell out of you and make you make it almost impossible for you to do what you want to do. They're not making 29 three-pointers every night. That, that's just not going to happen. Mm. Awesome to have it. You broke the record. That's not going to happen. It just really isn't with that team. I like that. That is good stuff. I'm going to jump in and just talk about um, some things that I've been impressed with defensively. Um, a few teams I've seen, at least so far this year, defensively that I really liked that have gotten better. Um, I think personally, and to add, I'll I'll say both sides, beyond them blowing out the Clippers, I honestly think the Mavericks, by adding what they did in Richardson, for whatever Mm -hmm. reason, that was a really, they don't have Porzingis back, who is an enigma at times, you don't know exactly what's going to happen with him. Um, But I think Dallas, surprisingly, is an under the radar team, even though they made a little bit of noise in the playoffs last year. They are an under the radar team who I think got better by adding trading for green and then going and getting Richardson right after that, getting rid of Danny green almost immediately and getting Jason Richardson or getting not Jason, Richardson, but getting Richardson in there from Philly. And he's just been a seamless fit. They are on both ends. He's a great defender too. I I really didn't know that about him, but I'm, I was watching carefully uh, the last few games they played the Lakers and then they played the Clippers or I'm sorry, they played the Clippers, then the Lakers. And both times he, he just glared off the screen as a, a massive disruptor that I, I didn't know he was like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I see Dallas as kind of a sneaky team that I, I like really that. like on both ends. Uh, Luca is extremely out of shape still. Um, yeah. <laughs> but when he rounds into form in about a month, um, he is, oh my God, that he is so special. And um, like you said, they're, they're holding opponents right now to 105 points a game. They okay. have an eight point point differential right now. Um, that's the best we've seen from them in quite a while. And again, I know it's early, but that's huge. 
I love that. And see, I didn't, this was just off an eye test. So for you to say that it's matching what I've been seeing, it's, it's a hundred percent true. So what they did sneakily under the radar um, has stood out to me um, big time. And, and I, I agree with you, uh, Coach O with Atlanta on the offensive end, obviously the Lakers, I think are the top team right now uh, offensively in terms of the offensive rating category. Mm-hmm. Um and and they're they're um they're just gonna keep getting better, I think, too. You know? Yeah. They're yeah. Just gonna keep, they're they're so yeah. talented. We don't, you know, we don't need to keep talking about that. But the Lakers are just they have ten guys <laughs> that you can I mean, really, all ten of their guys can just seamlessly fit and, and they do have some concerns on the defensive end, but wow, mm-hmm. good luck stopping them all year. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's a handful. So um so with that, we are going to um, – was there anything else that stood out to either two of you that you guys wanted to hit on that I, I didn't give an opportunity to do? Was there anything else, at least from the early start of the season, you guys wanted to hit on? Let me go back to that defensive kind of surprising, and I'm going to go right back to the Suns because when I started thinking about this when we were getting to getting together, kind of thinking about what we were going to talk about this evening, they're holding people to 98.5 points a game. Their defense is 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 really really good as well. So can that keep going on? I don't know, but they have this floor general out there in Chris Paul now that is is going to keep these boys playing really really well. You you, you know you you have an OKC possibility, but with better players. Yeah, you know, they played for not just the coach; they played for Chris Paul, yep. and that's what these this team is going to do. So the fact that they're actually right now, as far as points per game they're the best defense in the league at, at the moment in the, in the way too early category of five games. Yeah. And they got their pit bull. I mean, they got, they got exactly what they needed. Um, he is an absolute pit bull. So, mm. <laughs> all right. So we are, um, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, um, coach, O is going to break down some things, some actions, um, some X's and O's as our show is titled. Um, that he's seen that, uh, and Zach and I are going to talk about a few things we've seen, um, some trends offensively across the NBA. So hang with us and we will be right back. Welcome back to X's and O's NBA breakdown. I'm your host, Mark Tinklenberg. And again, I'm here with my co-host Zach Walker. And we have a special guest this week, Coach O. And um, we want to thank Coach O, first of all, for, for being here. I know he said thank you earlier, but Zach and I are appreciative of you coming on and, and kind of breaking down some of this. Coach O and I, as we talked about, we've been talking a lot of basketball, um, just about some things that we've noticed across the NBA. He's currently residing in Montreal in Canada. And so I'm going to let him talk. I have just been waiting to hear. I've been dying to hear kind of his basketball experience um, on the Canadian side and just kind of what that looks like and maybe what he feels like are some differences, some similarities, and, and I'm going to let him take it away and kind of talk about his experience in that category. Thanks so much. So um, I played, I played basketball in college. Uh, growing up, I was a, I was a big hockey player because, <laughs> you know, I'm in Canada, so I was a big hockey player, but, you know, fell in love with basketball and I ended up playing in college at a school called Vanier College in Montreal, Quebec. And how Vanier College works is basically, imagine like you have JUCO in the US, right? And imagine like you have JUCO, but you're allowed four years and you could play, you you could play until you're like 22. That's basically what it is. (laughs) Yeah. So it's like a prep under and then Years combined with that, you have, I'm trying to explain this properly for people, but let's say after finishing your JUCO, you go play D1. D1, you would basically have another, another um, four years because so in total, you could play eight years in total between the two. I hope it's, it's, it's making sense, but anyways, it's, it's, it's considered a prep. Okay. And yeah, I played there. Um, had a lot of fun. So now when it came time for me to choose uh, which university, I tried out different universities to try to play. The greatest thing ever happened. I got cut. 
And automatically, you know, basketball has been that itch, you know, it's kind of like that, that person, that person you want to be with, but she don't want to be with you, but you're like, you keep falling. So I just went, (laughs) oh man. (laughs) So I just kept, kept. And then at at some point, someone told me, asked me, Hey, do you want to coach a a grade four or five team? I started coaching there and never looked back since. So I've had different opportunities to coach in college and universities. And now I am coaching with a nonprofit organization called Sun Youth. And right now it's just helping kids. So uh, in a nutshell, that's a little basketball experience. I come with you with the perspective of I never got a chance to play at a high level. So what I bring to you, what I bring to my players is that perspective of underdog, always wanting to get to that next level. So um, there's different levels in basketball, but to me, that's what I bring to the game. That's what I want to give back. So I love that. Yeah. that that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. A very unique experience. I did not yeah. know that about Canadian basketball in college. I, I had yeah. no idea. Yeah. Bro, I got to yeah. tell you, if I was playing when I was 25 years old and I was mm-hmm. in college, I'd be putting it mm-hmm. on. <laughs> so, so after the, the prep, basically Vanier College, you could go to university and basically university, you have five years of legi- eligibility. So sometimes we have like U.S. players who come down to come play one year. And sometimes it's happened that we've had a rookie who comes in at 26 years old. It happens sometimes. Wow, that- so, so yeah, it's just like five years of eligibility. We don't have that clock like in the, like in the, uh, like in the U.S. That's awesome. But uh, yeah, never just being, um, you know, we were talking a little bit about how the Raptors and how things got crazy when the Raptors won. And it's been nice to see that growth. So like I had said, like when I started playing, I was a hockey player, but I could see now more than ever with the Raptors winning, like it's going to affect the game. And you guys have been seeing it. A lot of uh, Toronto, Toronto players, a lot of Montreal players, Lugens, Lugens is from Park X, Park X in Montreal, Lugens Dort, he's from Montreal. Uh, Chris Boucher from Montreal used to play with him at the park, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's, it's fun to see how a moment like Kawhi brought to the Raptors really kind of like changed the landscape. Yeah, that is, that is so awesome. That's so interesting to hear and talk about. Uh, thank you for sharing that. So tell me, and Zach, I want you to jump in too. Tell me some of the things, I know some things I've seen and, and I'm watching, you know, from a limited perspective, sometimes I'm only able as coaching and stuff, I'm only able to catch most times just the Laker games. Um, so I, I kind of cover a limited perspective in terms of time and, and, and being able to do that. But, but I definitely am catching trends um, across the NBA with what a lot of teams are running offensively and, and how they're attacking defenses and stuff. Um, you mentioned that Milwaukee is having a hard time with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but what are, some, what are some things you've been seeing and some trends you've been noticing? Let's give them the people who listen to this show a little X's and O's. And let's just talk about some things you've seen, some trends. And then, Zach, I want you to kind of jump in and tell me some things you've seen as well. Oh, here we go. Okay. So what I like a lot is um, I see a lot of teams doing this concept that we call the two-sided fast break. So two-sided fast break off of a defensive rebound. The game is changing. We're looking to try to get quick advantages as fast as possible. Back in the day when I used to play, they used to tell us, hey, point guard, bring the ball up the middle of the floor. Now it's a little bit less happening. What teams are doing now off of defensive rebound, we're automatically giving the ball and the point guard brings the ball up the lane line. So we're going up lane line to lane line. What that does is that that determines that this is the side of the floor that we're choosing to attack from. And teams have all their different, um, different actions that they run off of that. But by that dictated, we're able to shift sides as fast as possible. So you see teams like skip it to the other side and then attack reverse and things like that. So it's space. Now it's, it's less plays teams just run off of concept and they just want to be able to attack quickly. So that that's one thing that I, that I, that I like, I like a lot. um, We're talking about it. I have seen a lot of teams run that pistol. All right. And just a lot of, Wing players coming up to set those step-up screens for the guard bringing the ball up. We're trying to see how the defense reacts. 
then off of that, we have our trailing big just coming or setting a screen. Or even sometimes we just pitch it to the trailing big. We go get it. We see Trey Young do that. Sometimes you have the 77s. So Raptors call this a 77, the double drag. So instead of having one drag screen, we have two. If our five is able to dive to the rim, our five dives to the rim. But then off of those two screens, our five and our fours have to be a tandem, right? So they got to play together. So once you have one diving hard to the rim, we put pressure on the rim. The other one has to be a shooter. Other one has to be a shooter. And we're talking about the Raptors. That's one thing that the Raptors are missing. When they lose Marcus Saul and um, Ibaka, you know, they had, a, they had a big that was able to be a threat, to be able to shoot. And so now it's just about personnel. The team that's doing that right now that I like a lot is, um, is uh, there's two of them, actually. There's, I like Atlanta. Atlanta doing it. I like Clint Capella diving at the rim. I like John Collins popping. But um, I see uh, Philly. Philly's doing that too because they got um, they got Ben Simmons and uh, Embiid. They just buy, They just give the ball to the wing, and then Embiid and Simmons are just the automatic two bigs that are screening and playing together. I love that. Sorry, I'm going on a tangent, man. I'm excited. I love, <laughs> I love this stuff. I love it. <laughs> We were, well, that was one of the things we were talking about on our, when we talked about Philly and what they were going to do with that pick and roll and all sense. So that was actually something we were actually looking for, Tink, when we were kind of saying like Philly in with Doc coming over and what changes are going to be made. So that was kind of what things that we noticed. And it's, it's cool to see them put that in action and it's working so far. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, they're playing really, really well. That's another team that's, you know, they're, they're three and one up there in the East and they're playing really, really good basketball. And, and not that I like Philadelphia, but I hope that it actually continues because like, when you look on paper, that team's super, super talented. That team's stacked so much defensive potential. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like it, it's, they, they, they're one of those where like the fact that they've been four and five in the East has made no sense to me the last few years. And and this with having Doc come over and running these, uh, you know, running these systems, you, I, I think we're going to finally see them make it to that, that through, you know, they might be right underneath Milwaukee Nets and then it might be 76ers. And I think that's going to be uh, one of those things to look for. I'm seeing a lot and I'll reference our um, episode when we were interviewing uh, Jack Tink, when we, he, we're seeing a lot of that when he started talking about the one European pass that they, they practice a lot is that, that, that pass out to the corner, that hook pass. I'm seeing that often in, mm -hmm. in plays when we're talking about, you know, running the floor and everything. You're seeing that skip pass across the lane to, to wide open shooters. It, it's, 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 it's so cool seeing how all of these systems in the NBA evol is evolving almost every year. You're seeing new things coming systems. Yeah, and I'm going to preface my answer by just letting the audience know and – and I, I think we'll all agree. I don't think we even can comprehend. I, I know that I love this stuff and I've taken, I've gotten my hands on a few uh, NBA playbooks and the amount of detail and stuff and the amount of small and all the reads that go into all these sets and actions, mm -hmm. there are counters upon counters upon counters. And so what coaches do and what I'm seeing more and more in a good way is that they're running actions to allow players to make decisions in space, which you want in the NBA to make decisions in space. And, and there's a counter to everything the defense is doing. So what I'm noticing is that teams are running a specific set or action that they like, and they'll run it three or four times in a row and they'll run three or four or five different actions or counters out of it. So like something we used to see a few years ago was that action in Golden State where Steph would set the back screen for a shooter, right? And the shooter would go to the opposite corner. Then Steph would come off, as you talked about, and he'd receive a handoff and the big would roll. And then there'd be a drag screen where he, he could come off it and the big would pop. And now he's coming downhill and you're having to make a decision as the weak side defender. Am I going to step up and stop this drive? Or am I going to give an open three to Clay Thompson who – Steph Curry just set the back screen for, which I had to allow Steph Curry to get the ball in the handoff because somebody had to hedge that back screen or had to bump that back screen for a sec. And that split second of time in the NBA is so crucial. Um, and so 
you know, a lot of actions that I love seeing are when teams are running those and you're seeing the counters <laughs> live. They mm-hmm. run for a set and they're like, oh, that's what you're doing defensively. Okay, yeah, let's uh, all right, let's let's run, let's run pistol again and, and let's hit it on the left side and let's make sure that we hit that slip screen on the counter. And you're just it's on top of all the skill and athleticism and talent when you put systems that are successful for teams, you know, not the Lakers have completely switched systems, just going to them because I watched them the most. Now their offenses all run from the elbow and above to the top of the key, which I'm sure Toronto ran some of, I'm assuming with Mark Gasol, but all of their actions have changed from, you know, LeBron kind of working on that either mid post or the pick and roll game to now the offense flows to the top of the key. And then there's actions on each side and you have ISOs at the top of the key and you have AD ducking in sometimes for ISOs, but you also have him sitting on the perimeter. They want him to shoot more threes. Why? Well, probably because their offense is going to dictate the fact that he's going to get more three looks because their spacing is totally different based on their personnel. So um, yeah, I love what you said, uh, coach O and Zach, both of you guys made really good points about, some of the actions that we're seeing across the league. Um, but my kind of point in all this is that whatever you're seeing, this is, this is what I love about the NBA. And, and, and then I'll kind of stop my tangent too. But what I love about the, <laughs> NBA, what I love about the NBA is that um, all these guys, all of it is, is based on decision, quick, quick decision-making everything. Pace is, and space. You right? said it. Pace right. and space. That's what and you said. Yeah. That's what makes Honestly, it's what makes the great players so incredible. And and I hate referencing the Lakers, but God, that's why LeBron is so amazing. His quick instinctual plays that he's seeing a play above, you know, or, or play ahead of the defense. It's just those are it's mind boggling to watch, really, when you when you actually sit down and, and comprehend it, like, wow, these guys are not only that athletic. Uh, but they're making, you know, they're making perfectly timed reads and screens mm-hmm. and plays. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's really what the NBA is about counters and, and also putting guys in space and guys making really quick uh, decisions and, and not just that, you know, the, the quick reads on the screens and, and we try to get our guys to do that at the high school level. And, and that's the hardest part for kids to understand, you know, kids growing up in college is the hardest thing for me to understand playing in college, like the timing of everything and the speed of everything. Mm-hmm. These guys are, I mean, they're doing it like, you know, like it's just second nature. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, that's, that, that is definitely my take on, on how, why NBA players and teams and offenses are just miles ahead of, of any other, um, what else have you noticed um, in terms of some things going on uh, across the NBA? It could be defensively too, just some things you guys have noticed that have, have stood out to you maybe. So me, you know what? Zach's going to be happy. I, I watched the Pacers yesterday. I like the Pacers. Hey, you know, I like versatility. I like players who are able to do a lot of things, right? Just... I know you in the NBA, you have to specialize in things, but I think when you're able to hit your, you're able to hit people in different ways. I think it could be something that could be at your advantage. Yesterday I was watching the, the Pacers didn't win against Boston, but yesterday I watched the Pacers go from having a five out. to a horn set to just playing high, low with Sabonis, Miles Turner and Miles Turner's can shoot it a little bit. Like that's oh, yeah. fun. That's fun to me, you know. The, the I love and I like Nate. And I was one of those things when I saw his name come across. Mark, you saw my reaction. I said, "Who is this man?" <laughs> um, I can't pronounce his last name. Still can't do it very, very well. <laughs> but I saw it after I saw all of the the rumored names of who was going to coach the Pacers. I. And then he was the one that presented and not had even seen him on a list of any type of candidate. I'll be honest with you. I was a little upset. Comma, but it's a combination of they're really sick of Nate McMillan and they really like the new coach. They definitely needed a new voice in that locker room and somebody Mm -hmm. they could rally, rally with. Mm -hmm. And there, he brought that Toronto system. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah, giving these guys the freedom. 
Yeah. Absolutely. And because mm-hmm. we we had that starting five is great. I mean, it that is a great, great and, starting five. And let's not kid ourselves. Let's not forget that Sabonis didn't play in the bubble. Right. Let's not forget yeah. about that. That's a good that's at least a, scoring 20 a game, man. Eh? 20, oh, 24. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, that man's not playing any games this year. Oh no, you you had Sabonis not playing a bubble. You had Oladipo still not being Oladipo, which now we're actually seeing Oladipo in the first four games looks looks healthy. He looks like he's got his hops. I saw him do that reverse dunk. The reverse, last night. <laughs> yeah, and, the reverse. <laughs> and I had a little tear in my eye. I'll be honest with you. I was very mm-hmm. very excited. And and I'll say this, just again being a realist, whether he stays or not. We need him to play well. So if he decides to go, we can get some assets for him. So either way, I need him to play really, really well. Either go get your money and stay with the Pacers or go play well so we can get some good picks or get whatever assets we can get for you and keep playing well. Mm -hmm. Um, Pacers are going to be, they're going to be okay. Health is Mm -hmm. going to be key for them. Mm -hmm. Staying healthy will be very, very key. We're already seeing TJ Warren not playing tomorrow with the plantar fasciitis. You know, Sabonis is dealing with the same thing with his feet. You know, it, it just really depended. Brogdon was in and out last year with his his wrist and everything like that. But <laughs> that he's is, coming off. That is a he's great playing starting well. five. Yeah, that's a great starting five. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, it's a great starting five. It's our bench that we need to – what I like about them is Nate has them shooting early in the shot clock now, as you're seeing that free-flowing mm-hmm. offense a little bit more. Mm-hmm. They, they stopped playing that half were from Indiana corn – Robotic. Fed, they were very robotic, robotic. Very robotic is what Indiana's kind of known for, as we talked about, Tank. Like they're known for that half court offense. Mm-hmm. They're finally like, okay, it's 2020. We should probably at least try to play how everybody else is playing. <laughs> <laughs> and they're they're doing well with it. Hopefully it'll keep continuing. But what I do like is that they love their new coach, and that's the most important thing. Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. Um so we're going to finish this episode. This is going to be fun. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. We're going to finish this episode with some would you rather or if you could questions. Um, and we're just going to kind of fire away. And I, I just I'm going to fire them off and we're going to answer them and have some fun with them and have a little dialogue about them and go from there. So uh, it's Let's the go. first time we're doing this. So, Coach, oh. This is this is for you, brother. We're doing Let's this. Let's go. Let's go. You, <laughs> right? you know I'm ready. You know I'm ready. So if you could, question number one, if you could choose one player LeBron. to start a team today, LeBron. who are you taking and why? LeBron. At 36? <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. You t- Oh, you're talking about, okay, you're talking about right now. Right now. Today. Okay. Okay. Right now. Right now, and I'm looking. You got your whole pick of the NBA, current age, current stats, current everything. Okay, but starting, this, this is a, this is a tricky stats. question. So, but it's so tricky. This is this is assuming that LeBron is 36, yep. and LeBron in five years, LeBron will be 41. Kind Correct. Of thing. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oof. <laughs> I might. If I'm going to go sure shot, I might have to go Luca. Here's what I mean. Luca's game is very developed for the age that he's playing at right now. He's year three in the league. He's already playing a style that I could see him play for another 10 to 12 years. So I know what I'm getting with Luca. If I go with other players who rely on athleticism at a young age, it might be a little bit hard for me to know what I get. So if I'm thinking, I'm an investment guy. If I want my investment, if I want to know what I'm getting, I know I'm getting the game that Luca has is a game that I can see him sustaining for a long period of time. So I would definitely go Luca, and he's a big guard. We like big guards, right? That's right. That's we right. like big guards. We do. <laughs> it's it's so funny, and I'll just kind of I guess we'll go round robin and kind of go and question by question. I literally have written down in my notes LeBron's my easy answer, <laughs> but. It's just because of we've had however many years of LeBron, but again, we're saying that he's 36. Just turned that yesterday, today, today, yesterday. Doesn't matter. Today, today, today. Today, Luca was actually mine as well, and and I love the fact that what he came out and said, he actually finds it easier to play in the NBA than he did than it does in the Euro League. 
because of what he can do with his game to just making that statement alone is scary to me. It's like, he's only year three. What else are we going to see from this guy in years to come? And he's already one of the top scorers in the league. I think a more cut Luca, because I think you're going to see his body transform a little bit as we've t- mm-hmm. talked about. Mm-hmm. I think Luca is going to be that guy for a while. Luca's mine too. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. I, I see you guys. I, I hear what you're saying. If I'm starting a team today, um, I have about a three to five year window. I'm, I'm assuming. And I got about a three to five year window to establish a culture and establish a winning environment and to establish, you know, what I want to be moving forward. And so even at 36 years old, and I'm not saying, I'm honestly not saying this because I'm just a Lakers fan, because this is an individual question, but I'm telling you, even at 36 years old, I still have two, at least, at least two more years and probably three full years of LeBron James still doing what he's doing. And what he's doing is he's winning a lot and he's going to continue winning championships is what he's doing. And he is, has already the pedigree and the background and everything established. None of that even matters at this point. So I'm going to tell you that even at 36 years old, I'm taking LeBron James simply based on the fact that he is an ab, he's a freak of nature and there will never be probably, we will never see anybody do what Mm -hmm. he's doing for this long and continue to be the best play. He is the best player in the league still at 36. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, I don't know if that rain's going to end this year, but it, I'm watching, uh, I'm looking at some of the stuff in the early season. Mm-hmm. And in about two weeks, guys, we're going to be like, how is he doing this again? At we, have, <laughs> we have never seen, were well, you talking about a prime that lasts that long? We have never seen that in sports, but definitely in three, four years, I could, I would definitely go with LeBron. Yep. But if you're talking about long, long, long term, you know, I could trust LeBron, but I can't trust the people that he's going to leave behind after he retires, you know? Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. I, I, I agree with that. <laughs> All right. So there's question one. Um, question two. All right. Um, if you could play for any franchise. All right. So if you're a player in free agency right now. All right. And. Who would you be telling your agent based on ownership, GM, coaching staff, uh, not necessarily current players, but who would you want, what type of place do you think is one of the top environments from the top on the way they run their organization down to, you know, the trainers and everything else. If you're a player and you're in free agency, where would you want to go and why? I thought about this one a lot today as I was sitting, not doing my work in my nine to five. Um, (laughs) Let's be honest. The Miami Heat might be that team for me. Um, I, I see an organization that in with, with Spoltra, with our boy, Chris, with Pat Riley running things that they, they just, they get down there and they just get to work, which I love if I'm coming to play and have a job, I'm going to work and I'm going to, I'm going to go be whatever I get. They get the potential out of players. where like, there's not like, yeah, Jimmy Butler's an all-star, but there hasn't been a superstar on that team since, you know, Wade, LeBron and all those guys left. But what they did last year with those rosters and they have great players, but they just play hard for each other. And then of course, personal side of it, beer in Miami. Like, why mm-hmm. not? Yeah, like, mm-hmm. I'm on the beach. Like, personal side, I get to clock out, and then I get to go be in the beach. I think Miami is the team that I'm going to choose with the full staff and how they're running things. They're doing a great job down there. Damn, that's what I was. Miami was definitely on my on my Christmas list. Um, let me see. I think, again, this is a hard question. If I'm not going Miami, if I'm thinking about legacy, like, do you want to go in with a team that kind of has a chance to stand for something bigger than yourself? 
then that's where I guess, you know, me, you know, being a Canadian, I guess that's where the Raptors could kind of like be one of those. But the weather is not the greatest out here. So, <laughs> but if it's not, if it's not Miami or Toronto, I like Atlanta. I don't know. I just like Atlanta. I just feel like it's a vibe, man. You know, it's courtside, you get two chains, Gucci. Why not? You know what? Let's do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Why not? Why, why not? All right. So I'm gonna kind of, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this. Out. I thought, I thought long and hard about this, and I'm gonna surprise you, okay? But I'm going personally. I'm gonna go play for Mark Cuban. I'm gonna go play for the Dallas Mavericks um, because I love the style of ownership that Mark Cuban brings to the NBA. Um, he's an advocate for the players, first of all, which mm. if I'm, you know, if I want to go play somewhere, I want to go play for a guy that is going to take care of me, that, that wants me there, that, that loves me. And, and it is also advocating for the things that I need as a player. Um, he sees beyond ownership. And I think that's a, that's a big part of it. I also love Rick Carlisle. He's a great coach. Mm -hmm. Um, so they have kind of the ownership, the atmosphere in the arena itself. The way, what he's done in that arena is wild, man. I mean, he's got like 50-inch TVs and PS5s in everybody's locker. Like, sign me up, dude. I'm in. <laughs> and look what Cube's done for our boy Delonte West, right? I mean, if we're going to go outside the NBA and, like, he's reaching out to former players and former stars that need help, period personal level it doesn't matter cuban yeah. is the, he is probably the owner in the league period. yeah yeah yep. yeah that that's that's exactly what i thought that's a really good point not only is he going to take care of me when i play but when i'm done i know i got somebody that will always be there and that that's what makes the that style of ownership i mean it's it has to be attractive to at least go there and and everybody knows that about him so all right so who is your least favorite player? And the important part to this is why are they your least favorite player? So let me start. Okay. I'm going to start this one off. I and can't say Luis Scola, can I? It's, no, it's, no, it's he's right. to, okay. Okay. Just want to make sure. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Okay. And, and he's, he's a good player. I mean, he's a good player, but I can't stand Paul George. And we've talked about this before, but I just really want to make this as clear as possible, partially because it was the only way I could get this in this episode. But again, if you are going to say what you're going to say about yourself and your team, and you are going to constantly be throwing coaches under the bus and your stats prove otherwise, and your percentage of shots in certain areas and in certain situations prove otherwise, and you're still willing to throw people on the bus, former teammates, former coaches, everything in between, um, and you hit the side of the backboard in a game seven. Um, Zach, we're going to need you to come out of the game. Yeah, we're going to need you to come out of the game. I personally, I'm just, I'm not a fan. I don't think he sees it. I don't think he gets it. I don't know that he ever will. Um, he has just been paid handsomely, so he will, um, you know, he will live or die a Clipper either legend or he will live or die a, you know, in, in Clipper torture, which is where they've been forever. Um, and quite frankly, I just, he's not a guy that I would ever want to go to war with, right? And, and as a coach and as a former player, those are the guys you want to go with. Like, who do you want to play with, Coach O? You want to play with... You know, you, you won't play with him or, or you won't play with a guy that even if they're not as good, you know, they're going to be in the trenches with you. Right. Mm, yeah. And he's not a guy I see in the trenches. That, that's not who I see in there. Um, and he's also not a guy that takes criticism from teammates at all. Like you can't, if you and I can't have conflict in a game and you're my teammate and you're my guy and I can't have right. conflict with you or challenge you, I don't want to play with you. No way. You know, the best, the way you're going to get the most out of me is if I'm do, not doing my part, it's not the coach telling me. No, mm -hmm. right? If we're teammates, man, it's you looking at grabbing me and saying, hey, dude, you got to cover that slip. Or are you going to help me box out? Are you going to fight with me? Are we going to, you know, are we going to do, are we going to get dirty? Or are we going to just sit out here? But like, so when you can't take that as an NBA player and you're one of their, you're their first or second best player, 
Um, yeah, it says a lot about who you are. And at this point, he's not going to change, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just don't, he's just not somebody that I, I just don't respect that style um, of play. And, and those results will always show through. They'll always shine through. Yeah. Character always shines through in those situations. Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to go Draymond. I'm going to go Draymond for me. Um, I like his role. I like him as a player. But I think at a certain point when you talk, talk, talk a lot, I think you have to be able to back it up. You kind of had the opportunity with uh, the Splash Bros being out for a season. And like I said, man, I like, I like what he brings to a team, though. But I just think like at a certain point, I'm just not sure that, like you said, character shines through. I, I'm not sure he would be the same character or the same person if he was if he wasn't in like a dynasty, like Golden State is. So if he were to have played in Atlanta, in those right. years, in those years, we might not even know. We might not even know who Draymond is. Thank you. That's exactly right. That that is that's the key part about we him. might. Like it's the real, it's being real. Like we might not even like. Yeah. And Draymond's one of those guys where like, you can talk, you can be the enforcer, all that kind of stuff, but you hurt a team by getting in technical fouls and getting ejected from games just as much. So like, we, we kind of need you on the court, buddy. So I'm going to need you to calm down, bring it down a notch and just play the game. Like Draymond up there, it was for me too. Um, he cost them it was really, championship. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and he cost them four. And when I kind of went to my players, I had a top three. And what's funny is I had PG on there, former Pacers person. I need him to stop talking about my team. I need you just just keep keep my team out your mouth. You're not on the team no more. Okay. Draymond's up there. Patrick Beverly's up there for me. Um, I don't like the guy. He's the gnat at a barbecue that won't stop buzzing in my ear. I need you to just leave me alone and so I can eat my food. Patrick Beverly talks so much, but I've seen him do the dumbest things on the floor and not be able to back up his talk, which that bothers me. If you can't back it up, when I saw him do a step back on Montrezl game, game one and he hit the side or actually airballed, I, I like – Stop talking. <laughs> I need you to stop talking. So Patrick Beverly is probably my guy. All right. Last one. What player, rookie or sophomore now, rookie or sophomore, so first or second year player, uh, is the best in your opinion? Mm. That's, that's, that's an interesting question. I think – it would make sense to go Ja if you're talking about first and second year. It would make sense to go Ja. Um, my concern with Ja is athleticism is a big part of his game. So I'm wondering sustainability. You know, I'm thinking long term. Um, I see a lot of Derrick Rose in those. Right, days. right. And even like him, him injuring himself on like a closeout, like his athleticism is a big part of his game. I think that out of everybody, that of everybody, um, we're talking about rookies. Can I make a hot take? Hit me. Five. In when LeBron retires, five years, seven years, ten years, out of all these guys, I think Lamelo Ball is going to be like probably one of the faces of the NBA. I. Agree with you. I don't know if you he heard just that. Just got it. He, he was my guy too. Who I think. yeah. He okay. got it. He got it. Yeah, I just see it. Like it's just he's gonna develop and his body's gonna fill out. Oozing, a little bit. right? He's just oozing with it. You <laughs> just see it. Well, like, you see, like in in Pita, like his floor awareness and how he's seeing things already at his age. He's making passes that I don't see rookies making. Right? Like red he's doing things that as much as maybe I don't like the ball family, but I'll tell you <laughs> what, that, that dude is something special and he mm. was actually mine as well. So that's good. So that was actually mm. my there guy. We go. We're three for um, three. Yeah. Like that was my guy as well. I, I think that he is going to be something special for the Hornets or whatever team he ends up being on. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the thing. And like, because me, to answer this question, I was just like a quick, I, w I had to check out the top three of the draft this year. I think um, Anthony Edwards, I had a little bit of doubt because of the situation that he was in with, because you're with two young superstars. They don't care about you trying to go for rookie of the year, right? <laughs> Carl Anthony tells the other roster, like, yo, we ain't even make playoffs. <laughs> we don't care about what you, right? So that was that. And I think James Wiseman going into a dynasty kind of limits who he could be. LaMelo Ball, I keep saying this, and I keep tweeting this every game, every time before they play. If he doesn't start that game, they need him to start the game. And here's what I mean from that. You give a rookie top three pick the freedom to run our offense the freedom to do what he has to do he it releases him the pressure the coach believes in him it releases the pressure now what's happening is terry rogier and Devonte graham are two scorers you cannot expect Lamelo ball to come off the bench right now we're seeing half it's crazy that he's that he's do you we see that he has it and he's not even in that position yet you can't expect LaMelo Ball to come off the bench and just, hey, okay, give us that scoring punch off the bench. That's not the type of player he is. Not only that, you can't expect to come off the bench and facilitate to guys that aren't scorers. There we go. You you hit the nail right on the head. That's my thing. So I think one of those two guys would have to move to the bench. I would probably say Rozier for, for two reasons. One, you get that punch off the bench. But two, LaMelo Ball gets better. Because don't forget, Devontae Graham and Terry Rozier are 25 years old each. LaMelo Ball is 19, 19 turning 20. Skill adapts. 19, 20 year old is going to adapt to the NBA as being a starter. His ceiling is way higher, whereas Devontae Graham and uh, Terry Rozier, pretty much you're seeing what you're going to get from them. They might get better, but you see in a ballpark what you're going to get. That's who they are. LaMelo Ball has so much room to grow, and I think they're limiting that ceiling by making him come off the bench because then he's looking to fit in and not go off. He's not looking I, to be yourself. That is a really – that is really well stated. That's, that's, that is exactly what we're seeing uh, in Charlotte right now, and, and I agree 100%. That you're taking away the best part of his game uh, by bringing him off the bench uh, with people who are going to be limited to – kind of show off his skill mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. show off what he's really good at. Um, so I agree. So we're, we were three for three there. Well, guys, we are going to uh, close this show. Um, this has been a really fun episode. I, I hope you viewers got a lot out of it. Uh, we were able to talk about uh, quite a bit of actions across the NBA um, current things going on in terms of with teams in the early season so far and just some of our personal choices and preferences uh with an with a segment of if you could or would you rather uh that was so much fun zach i appreciate all that you do for this for this uh pod and coach oh man that was man that was fun and and i'm gonna let you coach oh put your plug in here so that the <laughs> viewers can can come and check you out and see what you got to offer Oh, thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. Again, me, I'm Coach O. Um, me, long term, my goal is to become a professional coach. So I'm always willing to connect and talk with people. So you guys can connect with me on social media at Coach O365 because I'm Coach O365 days in the day. <laughs> you know, so yeah. Ah, I see so what you did there. I see what you did there. Yeah. Coach O365 on all social medias, on YouTube recently started going in on the YouTube, giving you guys that bomb visual content. Coach O365 on YouTube. Man, yo, Mark, Zach, thank you, man. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Like I said, man, it's, it's, it's amazing to be here. I love what you guys do. Keep it up. I get better. A lot of people are getting better and really appreciate you guys, man. Man, thank you guys. So for episode five of X's and O's, we say thank you, but we always end the episode with a mama on three because we love Kobe. So fellas, one, two, three. three. Mamba. mamba. Peace out, y'all. See you next Peace. time. Yeah.